morning? Well, let's get right into our series today. We are doing on the book of Ephesians, and the title is From Identity to Destiny, which we're going to break down in a few moments. How many of you, uh, I'm just going to tell you something, okay? Don't be offended. I just want to let you know something. You're a piece of work. <laughs> you are. You're a piece of work. And I'm a piece of work. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, hey, you're a piece of work. Go tell your neighbor. You're a piece of work. Okay? Now you tell your other neighbor, hey, knock it off. Okay? <laughs> the truth of the matter is we're all a piece of work. We really are. We're all a piece of work. And, 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 and what does that mean? <laughs> it has a lot of connotations in our society, but uh, we, we often hear that we're a piece of work because we are a piece of work. And we often think of that in a negative connotation, which in, in many ways it kind of, can kind of be a piece of work, right? And, and, and sometimes we, we, people are frustrating. And have you noticed how frustrating people can be? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you're frustrating too, but you are a piece of work. And this is the truth of the matter is this. For Bible says, for we, in Christ, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, we believe, the Bible says that you're made by God for God, all of us. If you're alive and you're breathing, your heart is breathing, heart is breathing, your heart is beating and your lungs are breathing, you have a purpose. God has created you for a purpose and a reason. There's no accidents. God has, has you here for a reason. And so the objective simply is this, is to go back to the manufacturer. Who's the one that made us? Who's the one that loves us? And so we are his workmanship. And we actually get the word, and the Greek is poem. You're like, you're a poem. You are his piece of art, right? You're beautiful to him. The problem is we got to be able to submit ourselves to our creator. And, and as a result of that, we find the best life we could all ever find. So you are a piece of work. I don't know, I used to like to watch this guy. It's pretty interesting. I wish he had his hair. Uh, but anyhow, and, and, and so you watch these programs, and you got this canvas, and all of a sudden they start putting paint on them. Like, what, what is he doing? I, it makes no sense when you're seeing it. I don't know if you've ever found in your life things are happening in your life. God, what is going on in my life? Why is this color in my life? Why do I have this mark in my life? What is going on with my life? And then eventually you can see how God is painting you to be a masterpiece. If you'll let him. If you're let them, you see, you're a piece of work for sure, okay? And the Bible talks about that, and I just want to encourage you. We're going to go past this and go right into the message today. The Bible says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We're going to break it down a little bit, but I wanted to remind everybody a couple of things, and this is our series that's been on Ephesians. Ephesians is written by the Apostle Paul, who is one of the greatest apostles in the New Testament. He wrote a third of the New Testament. He used to be a terrorist, by the way kind of like Osama bin Laden. He really was. I mean, he was persecuting Christians. He was rounding them up and being there and watching them get executed. And then he had an encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to a city called Damascus. And God called him into the ministry. And he became an amazing, amazing person that spread the news of Jesus around the known world and planted church. And Ephesus was a major city with a major cultural center they had temples there. They worshiped false gods. They had temple prostitutes. It was debauchery. It was bad. It made Las Vegas look like uh, Quasi Amusement Park. <laughs> if you don't know what Quasi Amusement Park is, you're missing out. All right. So, and so well, that's, what, that's what happened. And he wrote this book to the Ephes church in Ephesus. And he's basically, he's, um, it's in a masterful work. He takes the first three chapters describing what it means to be a believer in Christ. And then he takes that information and he begins to flesh it out, what it looks like in relationships, in marriage with, her, with your boss, and how to fight a spiritual battle. So it's a pretty amazing book. So today we're, we're continuing with the basic thesis of this whole series is this. Your identity leads to your destiny. It's very important you rightly think about yourself because your identity leads you to your destiny. Make no mistake, there's a reason why there's such a confusion about identity today because we believe we fight against spiritual forces. We believe there's evil out there. And it isn't people, it's the people behind the evil. There, there's spiritual forces out there. And what they're trying to do, everybody, if you don't think there's evil, look what happens in the world. And they're trying to get you to believe a lie about yourself. If you believe a lie about yourself, you'll drive towards that lie. 
And so your identity leads you to your destiny. So if you think you're worthless, you think you're a loser, you think you can't, you don't know relationships very well, you think you can't make money, everything you touch is a failure, you start believing that kind of stuff, guess what's going to happen? You're going to start acting out what the programming you're putting in your mind is. Now, by the way, I didn't make this up. This is in the Bible. And a lot of folks today in TED Talks and these self-help books, they're just taking the information that's in the Bible for 2,000 years, 4,000 years, and they're just fleshing out the truth because we believe all truth is God's truth. So anyhow, so your identity leads your destiny. That's what we're talking about, all right? And so we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus for good works. What does that mean? We are his workmanship. It means that God has literally made you and designed you. The Bible says before the foundation of the earth, God knew about you. There is a potential for all of you to make a massive difference in the world because you are custom made to do only what you can do. That's the good news. Okay? We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared before him that we should walk in him. Now, this is the end of chapter 2. Now, we're going to look. We're going to work backward. You, you ever find that? We're like a sports team, for example. We want to win the Super Bowl. Okay, if we're going to win the Super Bowl, how do we get there? We need to recruit the right team, yada, 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 right? So what we're going to do here, this is the goal. We're his workmanship in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, how do we get here? The Apostle Paul takes the chapter 2 and describes how we become his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we're going to go back now, and we're going to go for the first 10 verses. As we talk about that, I want to remind everybody what this series has been about. The two most important thoughts that you and I can have in your mind at any given time is what you think about God and what you think about yourself. Even if you're an atheist, if you don't think about God, that, that affects how you live, right? Right? By the way, atheism, there's nothing there, okay? So what we think about God and what we think about ourselves pretty much runs our entire life. That's a whole operating system. What do you think about God? If there's no God, I can do whatever I want to do. There's no consequences, good or bad, right? It's my life. I do what I want. I'm never going to have to answer to anybody. I'm my own God. If you think that way, there's going to be consequences. And what do you think about yourself? Okay, those two things are very important and they shape your life. And so this is very important. We understand how the right thinking and and, in our culture today, we often think this way. I do, therefore I am, right? But really in the Bible, this is how it really works. I am, therefore I do. So out of your identity comes your behavior. So we're really not interested in parsing out everyone's behavior because that's a waste of time initially. It's so much better to get people to know that they're created by God for God. When they understand that, then their behavior is going to reflect their designer. Does that make sense? So rather than waste your time, and even in parenting everybody, it's so much better to to parent for the heart than than just the works. But works do matter. Uh, By the way, behavior matters. It does. But I am goes before I do. If I do goes before I am, it's a disorder. Order matters. I am, therefore I do. Does it make a difference what I do? Absolutely. But you're chasing your tail if you do the other way around. Does that make sense? Are you tracking with me? Okay, great. Awesome. So, identity. We cannot find who we really are without knowing who God is. And if we want to change our destiny, we must change what we think about God and we think about ourselves. Now, the Bible is so clear. The Apostle Paul, who wrote also the book of Romans writes a very pivotal verse in the Bible, I believe helps explain how you and I can change our lives and actually live a meaningful life. Who wants to live a meaningful life here today? Okay. How many just want to just live a whatever happens, happens life? I don't think any of us, right? We want to make a difference in one way or another. All right? And this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, do not be conformed, do not be shaped to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing. Now, the word transformed is the same word we get metamorphosis or those, hor- those pesky, uh, <laughs> horrible caterpillars that eat all the leaves on the trees. A couple of years ago, they went, bun- I remember a couple of years ago, it was like a biblical plague. Those things were everywhere. And what do they do? They eat all the leaves, then they kind of make a little fort for themselves, go into a chrysalis, and then, and then they become moths to eat your clothes. It's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful scenario. Have you ever noticed they only eat the clothes that you like? 
And do not be conformed, but be transformed by how? The renewing, rewiring of your mind. Of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I mean, God made everything. He knows more things than you do. Why not listen to the creator of all the universe who made you, right? Why would you listen to a four-year-old if you're a parent that's 25 years old? And that'd be foolish, right? We're, we're like four-year-olds sometimes. I want to play in the street. No, not a good idea. I want to drink Windex. No, 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 do that. It won't kill you, but it'll send you to the emergency room, all right? So I want to encourage you that how you think matters, and I've been doing some reading, and I'm not an expert in this, but it's very interesting that we're finding through neuroscience that we have neural pathways. And, and there's our mind, and our path, there's like little roads that take place, or synapses, and electricity kind of fires between them. And what's so interesting is this, uh, that, that when you think a certain way, it makes a pathway. The more you think that pathway, the stronger that pathway becomes. For example, uh, we have lawn here in the church, and uh, I... I I don't know what it is. I must be getting old or something because I notice I start caring about lawns. <laughs> so if you ever hear, get off my lawn, that's me, okay? So, <laughs> so anyhow, so if you walk across the lawn and, and you find a shortcut because you don't want to walk around the whole thing, you keep doing that, what happens then? The grass dies and there's a what? Path. And what happens? Everyone is, oh, there's a shortcut. Let's walk across the lawn of Cornerstone Church and mess up the lawn because after all, there's a pathway there. So you start having that pathway. The more people walk that pathway, the wider that path gets, the more ingrained it becomes. There's no more weeds. It just becomes a dirt path, right? And then later on, like, you know, we might as well just pave that. And then we end up paving it because it makes sense. Well, in the same way, when you and I think certain thoughts, there are neural pathways that happen. Whether it's true or lies, if you think I'm no good, or, or if you think like I, I'm bad with names, I, I'm bad with relationships, I, I have no self-control, and you start thinking that path over and over, no one loves me, no one cares about me, I, 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 every relationship I have destroyed, oh, stupid me, I, I, and you keep thinking those thoughts, what happens is there's a pathway, and it goes on and on and on and on until it becomes so wide, and then your, body, your mind goes, cool, let's release some chemicals for emotions about um, being depressed and being sad about this. And now you have this going on. And so literally, the, I'm not making this up. The, the science says, oh, by the way, you can change your mind the way you think. Really? The Bible talked about that two, three, four thousand years ago. So you want to change your life, change the way you think. Now that's fine. But you can think the wrong thoughts that are, that are lies. How about take God's word and let him change the way you think? So a lot of us need to rewire. I do. I need to rewire my brain. In fact, I have to be a little honest with you. I, I used to say, I'm not good with names. I don't say that anymore. Now I say, I'm getting better with names. Oh, I, you know, I, I struggle with my weight. No, I'm getting my weight under control. That's why I'm wearing a jacket to hide it. <laughs> and black is a beautiful color to hide. So, so there's a positive way to say it. Right? So what you do is you, you kind of, uh, or I, I, am, I am made by God. I'm here for a purpose. I'm here for a reason. Tell yourself the truth. You see, at Cornerstone Church, we want to help you rewire your brain. In fact, we believe in brainwashing. I've asked the ushers to lock the doors. That's why we give you caffeine and a lot of sugar, because we want to rewire your mind. No, actually, all kidding aside, the Bible says that we're renewed by our minds. And so what we want to do is let God's word, which is, by the way, called in Ephesians, the water of the word. We need to wash our minds, clean it out, and put it in the right path. Get the right wiring and the right pathways. You see, God has designed you for himself. And if you want to change your life, you got to change the way you think. But even more importantly, you got to make sure your thinking is true and right and will work. And so this is what it's all about. We want to have good neural pathways. So we need to encourage each other. Someone says, oh, I stink at that. No, no, no. You're getting better at it. And by the way, this is so amazing. If you start thinking that I am, I am a loving and organized person that prioritizes my priorities in a very responsible way, I'm a good husband, I'm a good father. You keep on saying that, you know what's going to happen? Your mind's like, oh, he's that. And your mind starts driving that direction. It starts pulling on all. By the way, it's interesting. How many of you are enjoying chat GPT or just artificial intelligence? They kind of build it like our mind. And so it starts pulling things and it makes up sentences. 
It does. It makes up sentences. It, it will make up false information if you tell. It, it's interesting. I've been playing with it. Okay. So you say things and it pulls things up. And so you keep on saying a certain thing. It starts pulling information up. It starts creating that vocabulary for you. Same thing in your mind. So we want to make sure we're thinking God's thoughts, that we're thinking true thoughts, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever of good report, think on these things, and the God of peace will be with you, right? So this is all part of the process. And Ephesians does a masterful job of explaining who you are. When you know who you are, you can be who you are. And that's extremely important. I can't tell you how important it is. Your mind is the gateway of your spirit and your soul. Your mind is the front doors of your home. And so the enemy, we live, we fight not against flesh and blood, which are here later on. And the enemy's job is to get you to think lies. All right. And so you got, you got, reset the gateway of your mind. And you open the door to that, you let that in, and you begin to talk about it, it begins to rewire you. You start getting rewired, emotions get rewired, and then your subconscious, by the way, your subconscious is the kind of the operating system that you're not even aware it's running. It doesn't, it, whatever you tell your subconscious, it believes. If you tell your subconscious a lie, it believes it. It knows no difference. So that's why it's so important uh, we get the right information in. That's why we don't want to believe in lies, okay? So what does God say? For my thoughts are not what? Your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, then my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And this is not a neg negative thing. All it's basically saying, hey, God knows a whole lot more than you do. So why not let God give you his thoughts that are higher? Why do I want to live with a lie when I can live in the truth? So who we are in Christ and who we are without Christ. The Bible says in Colossians, the spirit of Christ holds the universe together. So the moment you pull God out of your life, you start falling apart. Why do you think we have all the situations going on in the world today? Well, that's kind of arrogant for you to say. Well, we believe the Bible's the word of God. We believe God created the heavens and the earth. And we believe that God's power, or lack of a better term, his energy holds it all together. I'm not talking about new age. I'm talking about the power of God. The sustaining power of God holds everything together. You pull God out, everything falls apart from a molecular structure to a, to a societal structure to a social structure. You pull God out, chaos ensues. No doubt about it. So we go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1. And he made, he made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. What is that supposed to mean? It means you were dead. You were dead. You weren't the grateful dead. You were dead. So what does it mean to be dead? Well, in the book of Genesis, if you remember the story, if you're not, I'll help you out a little bit. The enemy came to Eve and said, hey, listen, uh, uh, I know God said you'll die if you eat this. You won't die. You'll become like God, knowing both good and evil. So he was kind of correct. They wouldn't die right then, but eventually they would die. You see, what happened is mankind had a perfect relationship with Christ with God. There was a communication. It was, everything was firing all the cylinders. How many of you like when your computer starts to crash? Right? Is all this viruses on your computer? Well, what happened was we had a computer free of viruses. And that sin virus begins, it starts taking over. Next thing you know, it's affecting every program in your life. Everything's messed up. And so that first virus happened. It's called sin. And mankind tried to do it their own way. So what happened was this. Before, what happened was we used to be alive in Christ. When we sinned, what happened was our relationship with God was broken. The, 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 the conduit, the interface with our creator was, was compromised and broken. You see, we believe, again, I'm not going to get into all the theology of this, but let me just, for the lack of a better opportunity to speak more, let's just go say we're triune beings, that you and I have a body, we have a soul, which comprises our mind, will, and our emotions, and we have a spirit, which is the part that lives forever. So my body is like a car that, travel, that brings me around, right? And so it's all interconnected. So when we sin, Adam and Eve sin, when you and I sin, we're dead. We, we can't really connect to God very well. Our spirits, something's fundamentally wrong. But the Bible says you were dead, but you came alive in Christ. When you give your life to Christ, what happens is the Holy Spirit becomes, becomes a resident inside of you, and now he is working out. The Bible says work out your salvation. Work out what God's worked in. And so the Holy Spirit becomes like a general contractor that helps you rebuild your life in the proper fashion. 
It's like buying an old house in those TV programs, right? And you have no idea what to do, which is like me. And, and then you have a general contractor comes in and helps you, has a relationship with you, and helps you to rebuild your life according to its original design. And so the Holy Spirit comes back, and you start thinking more like God. And what it is, it's in degrees. I'm not there yet. I'm under construction. I'm under construction. That's what begins to happen. So it's a fellowship with God. So that's a part of the souls. So in which you once walked, so in you, he made you alive, and you were dead in trespasses and sins, right? In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. What is he talking about? Well, it's so interesting in the Hebrew understanding, they believe that the enemy was in the air. They believe in a different realm. And by the way, we call it parallel universes today. You know, they're smashing particles together. Oh, there's multi-universe. Yeah, the Bible talks about that. It's called the spiritual realm. Right now, there's a spiritual realm right here. If we had the capacity, if I could make a machine, I should write a science fiction novel. But if I had a machine that could all of a sudden open up this world, this spiritual world. The spiritual world, by the way, is not bound by time or space. So we're kind of stuck in this chronos, and it's, it's in a different realm. It's, it's right here among us, but it does not have to live into the governing, um, governing principles of the physical world. So there's a parallel universe right now. Right here, right now, it's a spiritual world. And there are angels, and there are demons. And it really is. And I don't have time to tell you all that today, but it is. But, but you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. There is an enemy out there that wants to get us wrong, giving us fake news and false broadcast in your mind. And this is what it is, the principality of the air. So what do we fight? We have three major battlefields you and I are fighting. You ever hear of the uh, military? We have the land, air, and sea. Well, this is our land, air, and sea. We have to fight the world. There's a world system out there. And that's the thing that all the kids say. Everyone else is doing it. And we all say, remember everybody, I told you this a couple weeks ago. If your, if your friend jumps off the bridge, right? Yeah, the world's doing it. So this is the world's way. And the world's way gets on you. I remember the days when you used to have smoking in restaurants? Am I dating myself? I used to go to a restaurant and say, no smoking section. It's like, what? I mean, that, over there's a, no smoking. It's like having a no peeing section in the pool. I mean, it's like... <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. So I walk out of the restaurant smelling like smoke. My mother said, were you smoking? No, Mom, I wasn't smoking. Honestly, I wore a leather jacket. In the 80s, we had leather jackets with shoulder pads, okay? And so anyhow, it smelled like smoke. So I had to take that jacket and put it in the porch and let the air get it through because the truth of the matter is you and I are affected by the world. Just by being in the world, we get secondhand world on us. That's why we have to be very proactive to make sure because we're not even aware of it. So if you don't think the world is shaping you, you're mistaken. If you can spend four hours a day flipping this thing, looking at a bunch of stuff, it's going to affect you. Okay, the environment affects you. So we have the world, the world system, everyone's doing it, it's okay. Listen, everybody, if you hang around a garbage dump and there is some putrid old um, steak that has maggots on it, you're like, that's disgusting. But if you stay there long enough, all of a sudden someone starts eating it. This is pretty good. You know, it really, it's a very kind of a, this is actually pretty good. Next thing you know, you don't smell it anymore. Next thing you know, you're eating maggot-infested steak. This is why I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> so you have the world system. Then you have the devil. Interesting enough, devil is the opposite of live. There's a spiritual forces out there that are out to destroy God's work. He knows his time is short, and he knows the, the, the whistle's going to blow, so I'm going to do as much as, damage as I possibly can. So we have a spiritual battle we're fighting as well. And then we have the flesh. What's the flesh? Our old nature, right? I know I shouldn't have that. Uh, I know I shouldn't eat that, and I have diabetes. But man, that Boston cream donut sure looks good, right? And you have that when you should not do it, or you have the flesh, or I have a desire to overeat. I have a desire to oversleep and not go to work. I have a desire to see somebody, and I want to be with them, so I don't care. I want to give into my flesh. If you live according to your flesh, you'll be a complete mess, right? So this is the battlefield we have with the world. We have the devil and the flesh, and you're like in the middle of it. 
And so Christ wants to help you, and the, and the way you navigate this is by knowing your identity. If, you're made, if you know you're made by God and God loves you and God has a purpose for you, why don't I want to do something wrong in these areas? I want to live a life that I'm not ashamed of at the end of my life. I want to get to the end of my life and say, wow, I actually made a difference. I don't want to waste my time, do you? And so what the beautiful thing is God knows he's created and made you. So he says this in the Bible, the spirit of, who now works into the sons of disobedience. So it, they call them SODs, okay? Sons of a disobedience. <laughs> Just tell, you're, don't be such a SOD. <laughs> Say what, Willis? Okay, anyhow. Sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in what? In the lust of our flesh. We were controlled like animals. I, I am hungry, so I eat. All right, we don't want to be like animals. Fulfilling, I mean, we don't want to be like cats. We want to be like dogs, right? You know, the, the whole thing about trespassing and doing our own thing. So what happens is you and I all make mistakes, right? But how many folks know there's times where you make a choice even though you know it's wrong? We had a, we had a cat named Fluffy. I'm still getting over it. Anyhow. And we told Fluffy not to jump on the counter, and she, and she knew. She knew. But you turn your back, that thing would jump on the counter. Right? You know, you know about cats. Cats don't, have, cats don't have owners. They have staff. Right? You tell a dog, don't go there, it usually listens. And so we're like cats. That's why the cats are demonic. But we'll just leave it at that. We had a cat. Okay. But the sons of this, among whom you also conducted yourselves in the lust of the flesh, I'm going to do it my way, right? Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others... Children of wrath, what is that supposed to mean? Well, wrath, wrath of God is a contrary. For example, right now, thank God, we have an atmosphere around the planet Earth. And there are meteorites and sometimes satellites that fall out of the sky. And what happens is the heat of the reentry, God has made our planet in such a capacity, it protects itself from meteorites, the atmosphere will burn up the meteorites, it doesn't hit us and destroy us. Okay? And so that's, that's the wrath of the atmosphere. So you and I have a nature that's sinful. And God's way and our, our way does not work very well. It causes heat. And the only way you and I can come in contact with God is we need a heat shield. Just like, the, just like the space shuttle, just like the rockets that have a heat shield on it. That heat shield is Jesus Christ. He takes the heat for us so we can meet God. And so we are naturally a children of wrath. But God. I'm telling you right now, you want to do a study about buts in the Bible. It's amazing. But God, it may be this way, but God, all through scripture, but God, someone should write a book, but God, okay, but God, who is rich in mercy, so we were a disaster, right, but God, what did he do, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, trespasses is I'm doing it my way, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it, made us alive together with Christ. But God did that for us. Ever hear of John Newton? He, he's the one that invented fig Newtons. No, John Newton was a slave trader. Uh, ever hear that song? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. Boy, you guys sound good. Congratulations, you're hired. So John Newton was a slave trader. He was involved with human trafficking before it became a political uh, correct term. He was going to Africa. He was bringing people from Africa to the continent of Europe and other places. And he was a slave. He was a bad dude. We should cancel him right now. He was bad. And so what happened was he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And he transformed. He became an abolitionist, which simply means he was against slavery. And his life affected William Wilberforce, who was in the English government system, who was an abolitionist, who helped influence Abraham Lincoln. And this guy, John Newton, was a mess. And God turned his mess into a message. 
and utilize his life for good works. He was dead, he became alive. Well, that's why we sing that song. And this is what he had to say. And I agree with him. I am not what I ought to be. Can I hear, oh no, right? I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. Can I hear an amen? amen. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. The church is not full of perfect people. We're, I'm, a, I'm a mess and you're a mess. But God has made a message out of our mess. And we should be, uh, we're in a process. I have, I'm under construction. I'm still being worked upon. How about you? Right? I'm, I'm under construction. Work in progress. Please be patient. Please be patient with me. So all of us should be on, a, we're, we're not there yet. That's why we need to help each other out. Right? We need to work together. That's why we meet together. Not just on Sunday morning, we encourage each other on a large kind of like a large time we're having a dinner together and then we meet smaller in house to house and smaller groups where we help each other out and that's like for example we meet on Wednesday morning the men meet at 6 a.m. we have about over 40 guys show up it's fantastic and we just kind of share over over bacon and eggs and, and tofu Anyhow, and we just kind of just share, and the guys are saying, man, I'm, I'm struggling with this situation at work, or man, I, I don't think I'm living right, and the people call me during the week and say, Pastor, can I talk to you? I want to make it right. Where I'm living is not right, and they're like, cool, let's do it. And so what happens is we're under construction, and I'll say, guys, I'm under construction too, and we help each other out. It's so much better to build a house with a team than by yourself, Right? I really admire uh, the immigrants we have across the street that they're Albanians, and they bought a house together, and the whole country of Albania came to help them fix their house. <laughs> it's like, this is incredible. The, the maces are cutting things, and I'm like, what is going on here? And they all help each other out. It's beautiful. But what do we do? We spend all this money on all these people. What would happen if you and I were like that? We're from a different country, and we're helping each other out. Man, you struggle with, like, Finances? Well, I'm a financial planner, and I'm not going to try to get your business to make this all richer. Uh, uh, I have five or six kids. Uh, hey, I know you got two kids here, and my kids are doing well. Let me help you out with this. We can all work together, right? And we're under construction together. And, and we're all different parts of the construction. Some people are just laying their foundation. That's okay. Maybe your house is already done. You're putting an addition on. But now you have to put a new roof on, a new boiler, right? And you have to resand your floors. And you're, oh, we're always in the work, but why not help each other out? Well, oh, my house is better than yours. No, let's work together. Under construction, work in progress. God's working on us. And the Bible says this, by grace, you have been saved. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace, you've been saved and raised up. And for grace, you've been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When you give your life to Christ, you get his identity. He's your dad. And you may not be in, quote, unquote, heaven, but your authority is in heaven. Uh, you're like an American citizen living in a foreign land. You, like, you're a baby. You have a, you're born in the United States. you got a passport, you, you, right? And, and you may not be there, but you are, you are a citizen. When you give your life to Christ, you get a passport to heaven. And my identity, my home is in heaven. I'm not there right now, but that's my identity. And because my identity is in heaven, I have rights bequeathed to me as a citizen of heaven. And this is what begins to happen. God raised up and raised us up together and made us to sit together, which shows authority in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. Is that not good news? Grace is enriched and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you've been saved. Through faith, not of yourselves. The beautiful thing, I'm, I'm going to say it to the day I die. The most wonderful thing about Christianity is this. You're a wreck and I'm a wreck. We're all a massive screw up. Don't you feel better about yourself now? <laughs> if I were to take you outside on a beautiful night and the moon is in the sky and I were to say to you, I want you to jump to the moon. Maybe I could jump like this. Maybe you can jump five feet. Maybe you can get a trampoline. None of us could jump to the moon. That's how futile it is 
to live without God. We're not good enough. But Jesus is that rocket that puts us in a different environment, that takes us to a place we cannot go on our own. It's by grace you've been saved, through faith, faith to go into that rocket, right? It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any of us can boast. So if we're getting proud, church, man, I'm sorry on behalf of Jesus Christ and myself. Sometimes we're jerks in the church, right? We're just criticizing everybody. If not by Jesus Christ, where would I be, right? For we, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's our identity. You see, all of that creates a life where you and I can make a difference in the world. Who doesn't want to make a difference in the world? We all do. We want to make the place a better place. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much that you love us, you have good plans for us. And Father, we thank you for us that gave our lives to Christ, that we were created in you for good works. We thank you our good works don't save us, but because we're saved, because we're redeemed, because we're forgiven, because we're loved, then we can be the people, the men, and the women you created us to be. So Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, we want our minds to be erased from the lies. We want to be reprogrammed to know who we are in you, in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you a question today. If you were to die today, God forbid, and you were to go to heaven, and God were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? If your answer is, well, I'm a pretty good person, I go to church, God's going to say, it doesn't cut it. There's only one way you'd be saved. It's through faith in Jesus Christ and giving your life to him. That's the only assurance of salvation. I'm going to pray a prayer in a few moments. If you'd like me to include you in that prayer, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus, and today, you don't know what's going on. It's like, it's kind of weird. You feel something in your chest. You're like, why do I feel like I want to cry right now? What, what's going on? Because the Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now. Maybe today's the day to give your life to Christ, and maybe that's you today. Maybe you never give your life to Christ. Today's the day. Maybe you used to walk with God, and you've gone your own way. I'm going to pr- say a prayer in a few moments. If you pray this prayer with your heart to God, you can begin a new day. How many would say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time? Oh, I want to re- excuse me, I want to renew my faith. Just raise your hand nice and high. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Several of you. Four or five of you. Praise God. Okay. Let's pray this prayer in our hearts together. Actually, let's say it out loud together, if you don't mind. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's your heart connected to the prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are God. I believe you paid for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead. Today, I choose to step down I'm no longer God. You are God. I give my life to you. Take my life. It is yours. Forgive me of all the things I've done wrong, both known and unknown. Thank you. Based upon your word, I am now your child. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.